Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In order to begin your study of radiographic anatomy, you must know the details of the skeletal anatomy first. Because the x-ray tends to flatten everything that is in three dimension into one dimension. In other words, when we go to the x-ray of the shoulder area, you will see the clavicle superimposed on the ribs, the ribs superimposed on the scapulae, and it becomes very difficult to separate these items out unless you know the details of the bony morphology. Already we've talked about the anatomy of the shoulder region, and here we can once more review it. The sternal end of the clavicle at the sternal clavicular joint extending out to the acromial clavicular joint, that is the junction of the lateral end of the clavicle with the acromial process. Underneath the lateral end of the clavicle will be the core, the little finger-like projection of bone for the attachment of pectoralis minor muscle. The head of the humerus articulating in the glenoid fossa. Posteriorly, of course, we have the scapula, which we can look at in a minute. But remember, again, the clavicle crosses the first rib very high up and masks a good portion of the first rib uh, from anterior view. But it can be seen uh, on the x-ray quite clearly. Now, if we look at the back of the scapula, you will see, again, the anatomy that we have been talking about before the vertebral border extending from the superior angle above to the inferior angle below, the axillary border, the spine of the scapula extending to its flattened acromial process. As I indicated before, there is superimposition of all of the structures in this area. Notice we have the very broad, flat scapula as a background, extending to the glenoid fossa, which articulates here with the head of the humerus, and extending horizontally across the top of the x-ray is the clavicle. Notice also that the ribs along this area are superimposed, one on top of each other, as well as onto the scapula itself. Radiographic anatomy is important because it's another way of viewing the total package of human anatomy. We have talked about cadaver anatomy, we have talked living anatomy, and now radiographic anatomy. Taking the clavicle, extending the joint laterally, in this area there is a, the end of the bone and a slight darkening before it joins with the acromial end of the scapula. This is the acromial clavicular joint. The humerus has a shaft down below which passes upward into the broad expanse of the head. And laterally here we can see the greater tubercle of the humerus. Lesser tubercle does not show up in this region where it is found because it is superimposed on the bulk of the head of the humerus. Adjacent to the glenoid fossa of the scapula is a protuberance of bone, the coracoid process, but because we're almost looking straight on this finger-like process of bone, you will just see a shadowy indicator of its position rather than its full uh, dimension. Because in order to show the coracoid process, we would have to have an oblique view uh, for a radiograph in this region. Looking at the scapula, we recall that the lower portion of the scapula is the inferior angle, and extending upward along the medial edge is the vertebral border, all the way up to the superior angle. The superior angle then continues over to the glenoid fossa, but in very few x-rays can you follow along that superior border to see the detailed anatomy. In fact, extending across here is a fuzzy white line in this general region going out to the acromial process. This now is the spine of the scapula uh, 
which is superimposed onto the blade of the scapula itself. Notice on the scapula, we cannot tell the infraspinatus fossa from the subscapular fossa because, again, these two are superimposed directly on one another, and therefore you cannot, with clarity, identify which is which. In addition to the osseous anatomy around the shoulder joint, we should at this time become very familiar with that of the cervical vertebrae. In the cervical area, we have seven cervical vertebrae. The first two are individually and specifically named the atlas and the axis. All of the others are given numbers, and that would be numbers cervical three down through cervical seven. Remember, the seventh cervical vertebrae is the vertebrae prominens. And because we have radiographs in the axillary artery that are adjacent to this region, if you now study the anatomy on the x-ray and having a firm foundation of the osseous anatomy, you will be able to carry this through into the thoracic and abdominal lumbar region as well. As we look at the skeleton here, we do see the spines of the cervical vertebrae protruding posteriorly, and the front of the vertebrae are called the bodies. These are blocks of bone characteristic of each and every vertebrae, as well as all the anatomical points that I will be discussing in a minute. Every one of the vertebrae, whether they're in the head, uh, neck region, the junction between head and neck, the thoracic or lumbar region, all have the same parts. And when we look at an individual cervical vertebrae, there are all of these named parts that every other vertebrae has, but there are special characteristics. First of all, the body of the vertebrae is located anteriorly. It's the block of bone. Extending posteriorly is the spine of the vertebrae. Every vertebrae has a spine, every vertebrae with but one exception, and that is the first cervical vertebrae. It does not have a body. All others do. Here is the vertebral foramen, which when these vertebrae are placed one on top of each other, forms a vertebral canal for the passage of the spinal cord and the meningeal coverings of the spinal cord. Laterally, we have from the spine, the lamina on each side, forming the posterior margin of the vertebral foramen. And extending outward laterally in this region is the transverse process. But here in the cervical region, the transverse process has a foramen passing through it called the transverse foramen. The pedicle is a very small piece of bone that forms the anterior lateral margin of the vertebral foramen. When we look at the bone in side view, you could see protuberances sticking up laterally here and downward in this direction. These are the articular facets and in lateral view to again refresh ourselves on this anatomy. Remember, things are going to be superimposed on one another as we saw with the scapular clavicle and rib complex. This is a lateral radiograph of the cervical chain showing the base of the skull above, the lower portion of the mandible forward, the cervical vertebrae passing downward into the thoracic area below. Remembering our anatomy, the building blocks of the cervical vertebrae and of all vertebrae are well shown in this area along the anterior portion of the vertebral chain. Bodies of the vertebrae. On the other hand, posteriorly, you will see the spinous processes of these vertebrae extending downward until we get to this very most prominent vertebrae, the vertebrae prominens. In addition to this, you can see that there are spaces between these various building blocks. 
And here, the spaces between the vertebral bodies are filled in with the inner vertebral discs. They're cartilaginous material. They do not show up on x-ray, but rather there is the appearance of a space between each and every one of the vertebral bodies. Between the vertebral body and the spine posteriorly, if you look closely, you will see oblique dark lines extending downward and rearward. These are the articulations between the superior and the inferior facets of each individual vertebrae throughout the neck region. Some of this anatomy cannot be seen that we were talking about at the skeleton because for that we need to look at an anterior posterior radiograph of the neck. In this anterior posterior radiograph we can see above the white outline of the skull and immediately at the lower edge of that the outline of the lower jaw. Again remember I said that all of these vertebral structures can be superimposed one on top of another and the individual bodies of the vertebrae can be easily identified in this anterior posterior radiograph but right on the midline we see white circles. These individual white circles are the spines of the vertebrae which is superimposed onto the bodies. Laterally you can see the articulations between the superior and interior facets. And on some x-rays like this, you will be able to see, if the angle is correct, the transverse foramina in some of the cervical vertebrae. As we go lower down on the cervical chain, the ribs become apparent as they articulate not only with the bodies of the vertebrae, of the thoracic vertebrae, but with transverse processes and then swinging around and out to go forward onto the anterior chest wall. Again, it should be emphasized that before you begin your study of radiographic anatomy, you must know the skeletal anatomy in detail because uh, this flattening effect that the radiographs have of making three-dimensional structures one-dimensional can be very confusing unless you know your osteology. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.